It is my pleasure to introduce to you Aaron Emmons and Wesley Hauser. Aaron is a student at the College of Holy Cross, and Wes is a student at Wabash College. They're both going to graduate this year with degrees in biology, and both were participants at the School for Field Studies Center for Rainforest Studies in Australia in the fall of 2013. I've only known Aaron and Wes for a short time, but I've learned a great deal about their subject, the subject of their research, the Lumholtz tree kangaroo, as you're soon going to learn as well. They have such a passion for conservation and community education, it is contagious, trust me. Professor Sigrid Heis Pavlov, the School for Field Studies professor who actually nominated them for this award and wrote their recommendation letter, shared with us that their group was that these two students among their group were chosen to present their research to the local community and that their research was published in a local newsletter for the local tree kangaroo mammal group. Their research results were also presented at the 51st annual meeting for the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation in Australia and this, this past July, and they received the School for Field Studies Distinguished Student Award for the Center in Australia. It is with that brief introduction that I introduce to you, Aaron and Wes. So we're really excited to present our research to you all today, and I would like to thank, I would like to thank, Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> We'd like to thank Jana for that lovely introduction and the Forum on Education Abroad for having us here today. Um, our research on Lumholtz's tree kangaroo inspired us on a connection between this subject matter and our global experience. And this is characterized by finding one's place. You'll learn today that we found out a lot about um, Lumholtz's tree kangaroo and where it's found, but we also learned a lot about finding ourselves within a world that is rapidly changing. And with that, Erin's gonna take us away. All right, so to get us started, just a little bit about the School for Field Studies. Um, at the heart of the School for Field Studies programs are, is a focus on environmental field studies abroad. Um, currently, SFS has eight different programs, semester long and summer programs, at different sites at various locations around the world. And each of these has a focus on field work and research and integrating ties with the local community. And now to hone in more on where we, exactly we were during our study abroad. So we were based in a far north Queensland rainforest fragment. And this is a picture of our rainforest center where we spent most of our time. And so this um, experience was characterized by coursework in rainforest ecology, natural resource management, uh, economic policy and socioeconomic values, in addition to the directed research that we're sharing with you all today. And like most study abroad programs, this experience was classified by immersion in all of the different subject matters that we had encountered during our time with the School for Field Studies, even to where the center was located in the heart of Aboriginal homelands, and our interactions with those people really influenced our study abroad experience and enhanced it beyond belief. It was great. So now, some visuals to help you um, picture what exactly we experienced during our time abroad with the School for Field Studies. At the top left here, um, you can see our class, our Rainforest Ecology class, going out and experience, experiencing the phenomenal worlds of um, environmental biodiversity that the Australia wet tropics have to offer. There's glorious uh, plant life and animal life that are really characteristic to this area, and a lot of us have been learning about these for years. So it was. It was fantastic to get out into the wild and actually see some of the topics we've been learning about for such a long time. Um, to the top right there is our directed research group. And you'll learn more today that we were working with a lot of pre-existing data sets, but we also had another project working on classifying the habitat for the greater glider and different types of trees that it would nest in as well as feed from. And so that's the group project that we worked in where we were actually out in the field doing some, doing some real research that's relevant to this community. Great, so another part of our study abroad experience was excursions into different parts of Australia to get to witness some of the different incredible ecosystems. Um, so two of my favorite of these excursions, one was a camping trip to the Australian outback, and the second was a snorkeling and scuba diving expedition to the Great Barrier Reef, which you can visualize from that bottom left photo. Um, and then, as we've already mentioned, community involvement was a huge part of our study abroad experience, and a key component of this is the homestay weekend. So everyone in our group had the opportunity to spend a weekend with a member of the local community. For myself, I got to go with two other girls in our group, 
and stay with this woman, Penny, who lives on and runs a cattle farm. And coming away from this weekend, I had such a greater appreciation of both the daily lifestyles and the values that characterize people living in the Atherton Tablelands region. So to give you a little bit more of the backdrop of where we were located, this red box region that you see is the wet tropics bioregion where we were living and where we focused our research. Um, there are a variety of environmental threats now facing that region due to land clearing for agriculture, logging, and mining. And as a result, the area was declared a World Heritage Site in 1988, which basically recognizes the biodiversity of the area um, as well as implicates it for more conservation measures. Something also to note about this area, it's only about one ten thousandth of Australia's continental land area, but it contains the majority of the flora and fauna of the country, so really important for biodiversity. Um, so where SFS fits into this is through a five-year research plan. Um, these five-year research plans are signatures of all SFS programs and really unique components of the experience, particular for the Center for Rainforest Studies. The five-year research plan aims at getting at the question, how can the future of the wet tropics in a changing world be ensured? So how the directed research projects fit in with this is they align with some of the objectives in that plan, and the projects bring together students, faculty, and members of the local community in getting at solutions to that question. So now let's dive right into our research. What did we do while we were there? And to do that, to begin, I'm excited to introduce Lomholtz's tree kangaroo. As you can see there, it's very charismatic. Um, it's classified as an arboreal folivore, which means that it lives in the treetops in Australian rainforests and eats the leaves that are associated with there. It's also endemic to Australia, meaning that it's found only in this part of the world and um, it's very unique to this particular region. So we wanna ensure that it sticks around. It's large, as you can tell from the photograph, um, very charismatic and it has secretive behaviors, which introduces some problems for researchers. For example, it's nocturnal, which means it only comes out at night, and um, due to that, it's hard for uh, researchers to get good sightings of this organism because you have to go out and spotlight for it, and so it's quite challenging sometimes. So, but, this introduces some big problems for researchers, like I mentioned earlier. We don't have much information on the organism's abundance, distribution, habitat requirements, or ecological services, and so with this fragmented landscape ever diminishing in the threats of climate change and things of that nature, it's good that we begin gathering this information because it's gonna be important. And um, that's what our directed research project is trying to do. So, so what? Who cares? Why is this information important? And um, one big reason is because currently, uh, the classifications in terms of conservation status for Lumholtz's tree kangaroo are at odds with one another. So the Queensland classification and the larger Australian classification actually differ. One is listed as near threatened and the other one is endangered. And so that's due to some discrepancies in the actual information that's available on the organism. Also, since we don't know exactly what this organism is doing in this environment, it would be a good precautionary measure to conserve it in case it's providing some very crucial benefits to this area that are necessary for its survival. And then, like I mentioned earlier, with the threat of climate change, if we have accurate data for where this species is found now, it'll be critical for future projections where we're trying to anticipate this ever-looming threat. And then also there is an additional social connection here because, as I'm sure you're all enthralled and enamored with the species by now, uh, other people are too. And so this is a big global draw in getting ecotourism to this region of Australia. And people come specifically to this area to see the organism out in the wild. And so if we can preserve the species for the future, we can preserve those economic and social benefits for the region as well. So now diving into our study specifically, what we focus on, uh, we've broken our study down to three separate aims. The first is learning to use ArcGIS, which is, stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, this is basically a computer program that can display and analyze geographic and spatial data. So we had a data set that our research advisor had been compiling over the course of many, many years that was a bunch of sighting coordinates of the LTK around the wet tropics bioregion. So we use ArcGIS to map these sightings. And then getting into our second point of our spatial analyses, um, we use ArcGIS to define distribution patterns. And then we looked for regions of overlap between clusters of distribution and the location of specific habitat features. And to bring it all together, our third aim was to use these occurrences of specific habitat features as predictor variables for regions that would be likely suitable habitat for the LTK, but hadn't necessarily been surveyed yet. 
Um, so diving right into the first part of our results, the distribution patterns. First, just to give you a little bit of a framework, um, this red box region, again, is the wet tropics bioregion. And any map that we show you uh, that looks like this is just a zoomed in version of that region. Um, so the first of these analyses that we did was a hotspot analysis. And basically, what you would need to take away from this map is that the red dots indicate an area where there's a spatial hotspot. And as you can see from this map, um, the main occurrence of that hotspot is in the Atherton Tablelands region, which is the region where we lived and studied. So then we also looked at six different habitat variables to determine which are most linked to our LTK siting database. And so with those analyses, we found out that vegetation type, elevation, and annual rainfall most significantly contributed to where our LTK were being found. And so now we're gonna shift to some habitat maps to illustrate what we were doing with ArcGIS, this geographic information system, and how we were using that to visualize the types of data that we were receiving. So here we have three maps for our significant variables. The first one is rainforest vegetation type. And for all of these maps, the little dots that are kind of hard to make out are our LTK sightings. And the different shading and topography of these maps illustrate the different climactic variables that we were analyzing. And so here you can see on the rainforest vegetation type map that our dots are mostly linked to those hot pink areas, and that actually represents cleared land on the Atherton Tablelands. But there's also a smaller percentage, the most highest um, next, next one up is mobby rainforest, and that's where these um, organisms have been known to occur historically. It's a complex uh, rainforest vegetation type, and um, that's what, what's been known about the species in the past. So that's good that our results were starting to check up with pre-existing research. Then in terms of elevation, to orient you there, the lighter shades of gray represent higher elevations and the darker shades represent lower elevations. And most of our sightings were occurring in a grayish area that represented 700 to 900 meters of elevation. And then with annual rainfall, you can see most of our dots are occurring in that yellow, green, and light blue area. And that represents 1,600 to 2,400 millimeters of rainfall annually. And one might imagine how these different variables are linked together because elevation can help determine which types of plant species are occurring there, and annual rainfall will, will of course determine that as well. And so there's a lot of intermingling, and so it's not too surprising that these are the three variables that are determined to be related to LTK occurrence. So to get into the third part of our results, um, using the data that Wes just talked about, we had vegetation type, elevation, and annual rainfall as the three significantly correlated features to LTK sightings. So Based on that information, we looked for areas where the most strongly correlated values of each of those features overlapped. We didn't use vegetation type because even though it was significant, as Wes said, the variable that was coming up was cleared land, which has implications that we'll talk about later. Um, so, but we decided just to focus on rainfall and elevation. So areas where these two most strongly correlated values overlapped are, oh, I'm sorry, highlighted in blue on this map. Um, what you also might notice about this map, discounting this top region here, these three down here look like they're mostly continuous forage with forests without much land clearing. And this is probably linked to the fact that there haven't been sightings in this region. Um, they're not heavily inhabited areas. But we would suggest these areas as good places to go for future habitat surveys um, to see if LTKs are indeed inhabiting these areas. Um, and be able to do more studies there. The second part of our results for this is um, a study just looking at recent and outdated sightings. So what you can see on this map on the right, um, we separated sightings into recent and outdated, outdated just being anything that was older than 30 years. And these purple box regions are areas that have clusters of outdated sightings without any recent sightings. Um, so basically what we suggest for these areas is just to go in, reevaluate, to see if the LTK is still indeed using these areas and also if there have been any changes in habitat features since they were last surveyed. So what do we take away from this study? Um, we'd like to walk you through four main conclusions that we have. Um, as Wes said, moderate elevation, a moderate annual rainfall, and discounting cleared land, this complex nodophyll and mesophyll vine forest, were the three features that were most heavily linked to LTK presence. Um, so based on our finding about cleared lands, what we take away from this is that the clearing of land doesn't deter LTKs from using the area, either to pass through, either on a, like a road or a patch that's been cleared, or if they've already established a home range in the region, that they will continue using it despite 
um, the absence of forest. Um, linked to this is our conclusion that the LDK may indeed be opportunist and generalist. Basically what we mean by this is that the most important feature in determining where LTKs are found seems to be their pre-established home range, which they establish when they reach adulthood, rather than the specific changes to the area that might come as a result of land clearing or forest fragmentation. And finally, as you saw from our maps, that we have these regions where the habitat features that we found to be strongly linked do overlap, and they would be good areas to go in and continue studying the LTK. And on that note, the really cool thing about our research is that it wasn't being conducted in a vacuum. There were tons of implications for conservation. So again, like I mentioned earlier, this information will help inform conservation status of the species for the future, and that'll help determine what types of levels of protection are instituted to ensure its survival. Also, we have more areas now that we can survey to see where the species is actually occurring, which will be helpful for our data sets in the future. Additionally, it'll show prime areas where we can use corridors to link the different habitat patches, that way LTK can move freely from one area to another, and that'll allow interbreeding, which will increase genetic diversity, which will help LTK um, combat disease and other types of threats that will um, threaten its survival. And then this will provide numerous opportunities for SFS and other research organizations, as well as the local community. There's a really good um, tree kangaroo and mammal group that's very excited about our research results. And all these groups can, can uh, collaborate to essentially combat this very complex problem, work together, and discover key solutions based upon some of our pioneering work that we were able to do during our short time in the, in the area. So now, how did this experience actually affect us as people? So that is a selfie with, with <laughs> Boris the Bandicoot. So like I said earlier, we were immersed in this culture and in this local community. It was a phenomenal experience. And so for me in particular, that local community connection very, very much influenced my study abroad experience because I've had the, the chance to do um, different research opportunities in the past. I worked with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center as well as doing a couple of stints with Wabash College. And something that I noticed, um, a huge difference between the two, working in America and working in Australia, was the community I was presenting results to. And so the Australian communities that I had talked with about some of this very pertinent research very much grabbed a hold of our ideas, our, our data sets, and wanted to get involved in the local community, step outside that ivory tower of academia, and get some of these research results into some practical applications. And that was, it, it very much showed me that what we're doing is, is relevant, and what we're doing is empowering, and so it was great. Something else that was characteristic of our experience was diving into the unknown. We mentioned Geographic Information Systems, GIS. We learned that program in four weeks, and so we had no prior exposure to that program before. And so um, going in and learning these skill sets rapidly is important for um, how we'll be developing in our careers in the future. And I think that study abroad sort of places yourself outside your comfort zone. And I want to commend all of you here for making that possible for students everywhere, such as ourselves, and um, felicitating those important uh, skill sets that will be relevant for people in the future. And I can't go without mentioning the phenomenal beauty of the Australian environment. We had learned about that, some of us, for years in our academic backgrounds, and coming and actually seeing these areas in person really reinvigorates your passions for um, naturalists, the naturalist in you, and what inspired you to be a biologist in the first place. And so it was a very empowering experience for me, to say the least. So something we've talked about already in this presentation, but for me is really like the honing in experience of this study abroad program was the learning through immersion. It was just incredible to be sitting in the classroom one day learning about some aspect of an ecosystem in the Australian rainforest, and then the next day to be, hop in the van and drive somewhere on the Atherton Tablelands to actually see that in the environment around us um, through excursions both outside of our sites, but also just in your walk from your cabin down to breakfast on the, in the morning, you got to actually see the things that you were learning about. Um, and it was an incredible hands-on visual experience. Um, and then something else that I've taken away from the study abroad experience, at the Center for Rainforest Studies, we lived in a group of about 35, 40 people where it was an extremely collaborative and self-sufficient atmosphere. Um, and also we practiced really great sustainable living um, practices, which I was able to take back to the United States with me. Things that I just didn't really think about before, wasn't conscious of, like composting food or being mindful of how much water I was using while washing dishes, but 
things that we really honed in on when we were there um, and I was able to adapt back in the States. Um, so we have a variety of people that we want to thank for making our research possible. Um, of course, Dr. Sigrid Heis Pavlov, who you can see there, our research advisor at the Center for Rainforest Studies, obviously was an invaluable source of the data for us to even conduct this project, um, but even more so just an incredible mentor and a source of encouragement and guidance throughout the research process. Um, we want to thank the SFS community, both the people at the Center for Rainforest Studies who were extremely encouraging to us as we were conducting this research, and also um, the team at the headquarters for all of their support to us as we've been going about preparing this presentation. Again, we want to thank the Forum on Education Abroad for giving us the opportunity to be here to share our passion about LTK, and we hope that you're leaving with a sense of why we have that passion as well. And of course, to all the sources of sightings who contributed data points without whom we wouldn't have been able to do this project. Thank you. Thank you very much.